You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1164 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The 3Y0J, the expedition to Beauvais Island, has been canceled. A victim of the COVID pandemic. We will have the details. Nominees for ARRL directors and vice directors are being solicited in five divisions. A cyber attack has occurred at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. We will tell you all about it. A special event station celebrating Slovenian independence runs through the rest of 2021. We will have the results from the May 2021 volunteer monitoring system. A slow scan television event is set to run from the International Space Station. If you're preparing your station for the upcoming hurricane season, please remember that family comes first during your hurricane preparations this year. We will have the details. A new and updated edition of Ham Radio for Dummies is being issued. We will have a special focus this week on international amateur radio news and a vision-impaired amateur sees for the very first time, utilizing some brand new technology. We will introduce you to him in this week's report. These headline news stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, takes another look at how the worldwide chip shortage is affecting cars and trucks and how it has postponed the release of new gear from Apple. He will also touch on the new bills in Congress that propose to break up large tech companies. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLEB, will talk about removing high technology for a change. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, he will take a look at the state of radio communications in the year 1978. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will present part three of his four-part series on successfully writing a public service announcement promoting your club's upcoming ham fest or meeting on local broadcast radio stations. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in a very nondescript building in Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting this week from the news desk here in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where spring has sprung, fall has fell, summer's come, and it's hotter than usual. And I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, looking for a bigger fan. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where all the weekend squires are coming out to mow their lawns, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where we're finally getting some much needed rain, I'm Fred, November Fox, Two Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the weather was almost perfect this week, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And now with our lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week. The Intrepid DX Group announced over the weekend that it has canceled its long-anticipated 3Y0J de-expedition to Bouvet Island. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report with the details on the now-canceled de-expedition. The de-expedition team had planned to travel to Bouvet via the Braveheart, owned by Nigel Jolly, K6NRJ. Captain Jolly told the de-expedition that Braveheart is being sold, and he's canceled the de-expedition's contract for the 3Y0J voyage and refunded its deposit. 
The expedition co-leaders Paul Ewing, N6 PSE, and Kenneth Opscar, LA7GIA, noted in a statement that the global pandemic has impacted the expedition charter vessel business very hard. The venerable RV Braveheart has provided outstanding safety and service to many de-expeditions over the years. Once it's sold, Captain Jolly will no longer be associated with the ship. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet Island is a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic. It is the second most wanted DXCC entity right behind North Korea. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The de-expedition said that it has stopped accepting donations and will refund 100% of the donations using the same method they were received. This process will take several weeks to sort out, so please be patient, the announcement said. We wish to thank our team for putting their trust in us. We wish to thank all of the donors and sponsors that gave generously to the project. We will continue to research other ships and possibly find another suitable vessel for a future project. Based in New Zealand, the Braveheart was the vessel of choice for numerous de-expeditions, including the Perseverance DX Group's VP-8PJ de-expedition to South Orkney Island in 2020 and the VP-6D Ducey Island de-expedition in 2018. Its skipper is Nigel Jolly, K6NRJ, a member of the CQ DX Hall of Fame. ARRL announced in April that it has awarded a $5,000 Colvin grant to the Intrepid DX Group to help in funding the de-expedition to Bouvet Island, scheduled for January to February 2023. On June the 12th, IARU Region 1 and its member societies continued the workshop addressing the future of amateur radio. Member societies prepared analysis on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats to amateur radio. To get a significant outcome, many asked their members for extensive input. These results were shared during the meeting, showing that, over the region, there are many common issues, but also differences dependent on the particular environment in which the society operates and its geographical location. To understand the differences on a more detailed level, the national societies from South Africa, Serbia, Tunisia and Spain shared their findings in a more extensive manner. In the afternoon, the session continued in breakout groups, leading to interactive discussions, refining the outcome of the morning's presentations. With this valuable information, a good foundation has been laid for the forthcoming sessions, including the final workshop in October later this year. The IARU has published a slide showing the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats identified from the survey held by the RSGB and other member societies. The key points identified in the slide make interesting reading. Under strengths, the strong and diverse amateur radio community was highlighted, as well as good relationships with regulators. The public service element of amateur radio was also quoted. Some weaknesses in amateur radio included how the hobby is portrayed and a lack of motivation and capability within the community. There was also concern about recruitment and retention, as well as the demographic of the amateur population. The IARU member societies identified opportunities as working to grow recruitment, develop technology and further support emergency communications, finding ways to improve the image of amateur radio and becoming more involved with STEM subjects, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Threats to amateur radio that were commonly identified were increasing noise levels in the radio spectrum, loss of parts of that spectrum, and more generally where amateur radio loses out to more powerful competitors, and the quality of relationships with the authorities. Further information and the summary slide can be viewed at www.iaru-r1.org. Full ARRL members in the Central, Hudson, New England, Northwestern, and Roanoke divisions will have the opportunity this year to choose a director and vice director for three-year terms beginning on January 1, 2022. With more details on the upcoming election, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files the special report. ARRL is now seeking eligible nominees for these positions. These could include incumbents or new candidates. It takes 10 full members in a division to nominate a candidate for either office. Nominees must be at least 21 and must have been licensed and a full ARRL member continuously for at least four years 
and must comply with the board's conflict of interest policies. Starting on July 1st, any full member residing in a division where there is an election may request an official nominating petition package in writing, either by letter or via email to dmethe, D-M-E-T-H-E, at A-R-R-L dot O-R-G. A valid nominating petition names the candidate and must bear the signatures of 10 full members of the appropriate division. Voting will take place this fall after the candidates have been announced. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. ARRL is governed by its board of directors. A voting director is chosen by ballot by the full, licensed ARRL members in each of its 15 divisions. Vice directors who serve in the absence of the director at a board meeting and succeed to the position of director, should a vacancy occur, are chosen at the same time. Elections are held in five divisions per year. The eligibility of nominees for the positions of ARRL director and vice director will be reviewed by the Ethics and Elections Committee, composed of three directors not subject to election this year. They are Mickey Baker, N4MB, Tom Abernethy, W3TOM, and Jeff Ryan, K0RM. A nominee must be at least 21 years old and must have been licensed and a full member of ARRL for a continuous term of at least four years immediately preceding nomination. Each nominee must provide information concerning their employment, ownership and investment interests, and other financial arrangements to ensure compliance with the conflict of interest policy. The qualifications for director and vice director are identical. All the powers of the director are transferred to the vice director in the event of the director's death, resignation, recall, removal outside the division, or inability to serve. There are three steps to be eligible for nomination. Step 1. Obtain official nominating petition forms. Starting July 1st, any full member residing in a division where there is an election may request an official nominating petition package in writing, either by letter or via email, to cperera at arrl.org. The request must reach the ARRL secretary no later than noon EDT on Friday, August 13, 2021. If you are seriously considering running or nominating someone to run, do not wait until the last minute to request the forms. The deadline for submitting a completed petition form is just one week later. Step 2. Obtain signatures and complete questionnaire. Only the official form may be used. The petition form has two sides. To be valid, a nominating petition must name the candidate and must bear the signatures of 10 full members of the appropriate division. The candidate must complete the other side, providing the information required to determine eligibility, certifying its accuracy and agreeing to assume the office if elected. Step 3. Submit Petition Form the completed form must reach the secretary no later than noon EDT on Friday, August 20th, 2021. Submissions may be by electronic transmission of images or facsimile, provided that upon request, the original documents are received by the secretary within seven days of the request. A person who is nominated for both director and vice director may choose to decline the nomination for director, otherwise the nomination for director will stand and that for vice director will be void. On Monday, August 23, 2021, the secretary will notify each candidate of the name and call sign of each other candidate for the same office. Candidates will then have until Friday, September 3, 2021 to submit a 300-word statement and a photograph if they desire those to accompany the ballot in accordance with instructions that will be supplied. In cases where only one eligible candidate has been nominated for an office, that person will be declared elected by the Ethics and Elections Committee. If there is more than one eligible candidate for an office, the full members in good standing of that division as of September 10, 2021, will have the opportunity to cast ballots. 
Official paper ballots and candidate statements will be mailed to eligible members no later than October 1, 2021. Completed ballots must be received at the designated P.O. box in the envelope provided by noon Eastern Time, Friday, November 19, 2021. The candidate receiving the most votes will be declared the winner that day. A full member residing temporarily outside his or her home division, including overseas, may arrange to vote in the home division by notifying the secretary prior to September 10, 2021, giving their current mailing address as reflected in the ARRL membership records and the reason why another division is considered home. Members with overseas military addresses should take special note of this provision. In the absence of information received to the contrary, ballots will be sent to them based on their postal addresses. The incumbent directors and vice directors respectively in the five divisions in which elections will be held this year are Central Division, Kermit Carlson, W9XA, and Carl Lutzel Schwab, K9LA. Hudson Division, Rhea Jirem, N2RJ, and Bill Hudzik, W2UDT. New England Division, Fred Hoppengarten, K1VR, and Phil Temples, K9HI. Northwestern Division, Mike Ritz, W7VO, and Mark Tharp, KB7HDX. Roanoke Division, Bud Hippisley, W2RU, and Bill Marine, N2COP. A major player in the real-time mapping of changes in the ionosphere was suddenly shut down following a suspected cybersecurity attack at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, where the facility is based. The University of Massachusetts at Lowell Center for Atmospheric Research was among those services impacted by the outage that resulted. The campus was shut down on Tuesday, June 15th, and an investigation began. The university posted a note on its website saying that UMass Lowell continues to retain control over its IT infrastructure and is working with a leading cyber forensics firm to identify, evaluate, and eliminate any issues that are discovered. The school established a temporary website for information at umasslowell.com. There's another big event coming up that's also traditionally connected to July 4th. And that's the annual transmission of the old Alexanderson Alternator SAQ at the historic site in Grimton, Sweden. The radio event marks July 4th as Alexanderson Day, named for the Swedish radio engineer Ernst Fredrik Werner Alexanderson. If you have a compatible receiver, be listening on the VLF frequency of 17.2 kHz CW for the call sign Sierra Alpha Queen. There will be two transmissions in CW. One begins with a tune-up at 0830 UTC, followed by a transmission of a message at 0900 UTC. The second one will have a tune-up of 1130 UTC, with a transmission of a message at 1200 UTC. Both transmission events will be live-streamed on YouTube, beginning five minutes before the tune-up. The only people present during the event will be those on staff, in order to comply with pandemic safety restrictions still in place. At the same time, the amateur radio station SK6SAQ will also be on the air looking for contacts. Be listening on 3.535 MHz for CW or on 7.140 kHz for single sideband phone transmissions. The Atlantic hurricane season began on June 1st and continues through November 30th. Two named storms have already shown up, although neither has threatened the United States. There's still time to consider making sure you, your family, and your ham station are prepared. Remember, your family's safety comes first. Here with more details on the story is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. Your first stop should be a visit to the National Weather Service page for personal and family hurricane season preparedness. Next, prepare your ham station and equipment for possible service and or deployment. For example, be sure to have multiple sources of backup power, such as batteries and generators, and test them to make sure they'll do the job if needed. Follow generator safety procedures to the letter. 
Test all radios, antennas, and peripherals, especially those you may not use on a routine basis but may want to use during a severe weather emergency. Handhelds, especially for VHF and UHF, and any HF gear that can easily run from emergency power. Keep a list of emergency and public safety nets handy. Some hams establish a hardened facility that's essentially storm-proof with ham gear installed inside. In addition, look for local regional nets before a serious storm strikes to learn or practice net procedure and get acquainted with all the players you might work with in a disaster. Finally, obtain and learn how to use WinLink HF email. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Rick Palm, K1CE, author of QST's public service column, said that he poured fresh gasoline into my Honda generator and ran it for 30 minutes to check its status, which was good. I mounted my generator on a small utility trailer for deployment if necessary. The generator is rated for 120 volts at 20.8 amps. Make sure you can take down and reinstall antennas quickly and efficiently when there is a threat of severe storms. VHF antennas mounted on mass and typical HF dipoles can be taken down and put up in minutes. Know the name, call sign, and email address of both your ARRL section manager and section emergency coordinator. In addition, look for local and regional nets before a serious storm strikes to learn or practice net procedures and get acquainted with all the players you might work with in a disaster. Net and emergency managers, Red Cross, community emergency response teams, amateur radio emergency service, and radio amateur civil emergency services communicators. Obtain and learn how to use WinLink HF mail. The advantages are clear, and that's why the Red Cross and others embrace WinLink, Palm says, in the July 2021 public service column. He went on to say, there's a learning curve to gaining WinLink proficiency. However, it's not a system for spontaneous volunteers. On-air training is available. The National Weather Service offers information on personal and family hurricane season preparedness. Hams in Slovenia are inviting amateurs from around the world to join them in celebrating 30 years of Slovenian independence. They're doing that by activating a special event around the number 30, beginning on Saturday, June 26, at 0000 UTC, and running through the end of the year, Slovenian amateur radio stations will be able to add the number 30 to the suffix of their S5 call signs. Any foreign radio operator contacting 30 Slovenian hams are eligible for a special award. At least 10 of the Slovenian contacts must contain the special call sign suffix, 30, but the rest can be the regular S5 call signs. Hams may make the contact using any band and any mode. Awards will be downloadable as PDFs from the club website. The Independent Republic of Slovenia was created on June 25, 1991, when the Slovene parliament adopted the Declaration of Independence. Previously, Slovenia had been part of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. The Dutch National Amateur Radio Society, Veron, reports that after many years, the changes to the Netherlands Amateur Radio Novice License have finally been published in the Government Gazette. Radio amateurs with a novice license have had to wait a long time for this, but it's finally fact. They have been given more frequency space to engage with their radio hobby, and they can use more power below 30 MHz and now have access to the full 40 meter band. A joint report on the changes to the novice license has been issued by the three main Dutch ham radio groups and the Dutch regulator, but not all of the hoped for changes have been adopted. But from Friday the 18th of June 2021, Dutch novice license holders may use 100 watts PEP for frequencies below 30 MHz, they can use the full 40 meter band that's 7 to 7.2 MHz, they can use part of the 20 meter band 14 to 14.25 MHz, and they can use all of the 10 meter band 28 to 29.7 MHz. VHF and UHF access remains unchanged. And the minimum age requirement for being able to take the full or novice exam has also been removed. It was clear that it would be a long process when the three main amateur radio associations in the Netherlands, Veron, VRZA and DARU, submitted their recommendations for change to the regulator. But the official response has appeared so much later than the expected beginning of 2020. 
Thanks to the cooperation between Veron, VRZA and DARU, constantly chasing up the regulator's progress and indicating disappointment at how long the changes were taking, the introduction of the new novice licence has finally arrived. The State Secretary for Economic Affairs and Climate signed the scheme, and having now appeared in the Dutch Government Gazette, the Regulation on the Use of Frequency Space with Reporting Obligation 2015 entered into force on the 18th of June 2021. The radio amateur organisations in the Netherlands would like to thank the Telecom Agency for their cooperation, which worked actively to smooth delays in the process. The Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate say they regret the delay. You can read more about the new novice license in the Netherlands at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Netherlands. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the May 2021 Volunteer Monitor Program report, courtesy Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH Volunteer Monitor Program Coordinator. Technician class operators in Palm Bay and Hollywood, Florida received advisory notices after making more than a dozen FT8 contacts on 40 and 20 meters. Technicians are not permitted to operate on 20 meters and have no data privileges on 40 meters. A licensee in El Cerrito, California received an advisory notice concerning use of his 444.700 MHz repeater for deliberate interference and unidentified transmissions. A general class licensee in Guanica, Puerto Rico received an advisory notice after operating on 14.187 MHz during a DX contest in May. General class licensees have no privileges below 14.225 MHz on 20 meters. A general class licensee in Texas received a warning concerning deliberate interference, broadcasting, and failure to identify on 3.919 and 3.922 MHz. The operator was informed that if such operation continued, the FCC would be requested to remove voice privileges from his license. A general class licensee in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania received an advisory notice for operation on 7.163 MHz. General class licensees are not permitted to operate below 7.175 MHz. A repeater station in Mission Viejo, California was shut down after the operator received a notice that the repeater was being used for deliberate interference. A warning was issued to a licensee in Erie, Pennsylvania for operation on 146.61 MHz and 146.682 MHz after the repeater licensee had requested in writing that the individual refrain from using the repeaters. Volunteer monitor monitoring totals in April were 1,784 hours on HF frequencies and 2,214 hours on VHF frequencies and above. The volunteer monitor coordinator had one meeting with the FCC and one case was referred to the FCC for further action. A slow scan television event from June 21st through the 26th will focus on amateur radio on the Space Shuttle, the Mir Space Station, and the International Space Station, amateur radio on the International Space Station has announced. Transmissions will be on 145.800 MHz FM using PD-120 SSTV mode. The ARIS team will be transmitting SSTV images continuously from June 21st until June 26th, ARIS said in announcing the upcoming event. The images will be related to some of the amateur radio activities that have occurred on the Space Shuttle, the Mir Space Station, and the International Space Station. Transmissions will start at or about 0940 UTC on Monday, June 21st, and will end by 1830 UTC on Saturday, June 26th. Those that recently missed the opportunity during the limited period of MAI transmissions should have numerous chances over the six-day period to capture many, if not all, 12 of the images. The ARIS SSTV blog will post the latest information. Signal should be receivable on a handheld with a quarter-wave whip antenna. Use 25 kHz channel spacing if available. Pastime predictions are available on the AMSAT website. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I used to listen to them when I was a kid. From a lot of my life, my early life, and that's probably why I got into radio, I used to uh, lie in bed late at night and listen to the radio. Did you do that? I used to listen to baseball games. 
I remember in 1969, I was lying in bed in, uh, we lived in Rhode Island and I was hearing about all the kids. I was 13. I was hearing all about the ki all the kids going up to Woodstock, how the roads were jammed. And I was thinking, I wish I were going to Woodstock. Then I used to, you'd have to do it at night because uh, you, could, you couldn't quite get it. But I used to tune in WOR in New York and listen to Gene Shepard late at night. Great, the great radio legend. Then later, uh, when I was in college, I would actually get up. And this is for a college kid, unusual. I would get up at 6 in the morning. Didn't have class, but I wanted to listen to Imus in the morning on uh, WNBC. And Reverend Billy Saul, Hargis, and all of the characters he used to do in that. But I think that's, you know what, now that I think about it, that's probably why I got into this business. Let's see, what happened this week? Uh, just saw a story in the IEEE Spectrum. Yeah, I read stuff like that, so you don't have to. The IEEE, which is the, um, what does the IEEE stand for? You know, that's a good question. The International Engineering Electorate. It's, a, it's an engineering group. And now, now, I'm, now I'm curious. I don't see anywhere on their website where they say what it is. It's the world's largest technical professional organization for the advancement of technology. Advancing technology for humanity. I probably used to know what it stands for. I don't remember. Anyway, I saw, that's, that's neither here nor there, because I saw an article on the IEEE Spectrum, which is their magazine by Robert Charette, how software is eating the car. The trend towards self-driving and electric vehicles will add hundreds of millions of lines of code to cars. Can the auto industry cope? Just to put it in perspective, hundreds of millions of lines of code, that's how many lines of code there are in Windows. It's, that, it's on that level of sophistication. I'm sure Sam's been talking about this all along, but it's it's kind of stunning and, and it's relevant right now because it, according uh, to analysts, the chip shortage, the global chip shortage is being felt everywhere, but it's especially being felt in cars. 4.1 million autos won't be made this year because they can't get the chips. That's a lot. 10 years ago, only fancy cars had microprocessor control units. Today, fancy, fancy cars like the BMW 7 Series may contain 150 electronic control units. Pickup trucks like the Ford F-150, 150 million lines of code. As of 2017, some 40% of the cost of a new car can be attributed to semiconductors. The cost has doubled in 10 years. And they think by, uh, by the end of this decade, it'll be 50%. Each new car today has about $600 worth of semiconductors, 3,000 chips in it. So it's no surprise. <laughs> I mean, your steering is controlled by a chip. The, the doors, the windows, the mirrors, the seats, the climate control, of course, the anti-theft system, the keyless entry system, even the steering column has a computer on it. That's fascinating. And uh, that chip shortage is felt everywhere. You know, I think Apple, I, now that I think about it, well, on Monday Apple had an event, and uh, you might have remembered that last week I was pretty confident in my expectation they would announce new laptops. They didn't, even though I think they really meant to because the uh, on YouTube where they put the video of the keynote up, they somebody made a mistake. You know, they put tags in like Apple and you know iOS 15, which they talked about Mac OS Monterey, but they also put in the tag... M1X, which doesn't exist, that's what some have thought might be the name of the next generation of Apple chips, and even MacBook Pro M1X. They thought, whoever wrote those tags thought, oh, they'll be announcing the new MacBook Pro. Clearly, they've got it. But I'm thinking that their plans to announce it, this would be a logical time to announce a laptop. This is when purchase decisions happen for kids going to college, going to high school in, in September. This is when people start thinking about that. So you want to get it out right now. You know, it's almost now going to be too late. But I'm thinking they, they, they wanted to, but they couldn't because chip shortage, chip shortage. Now, there's no shortage of Apple's own M1 chips because they bought up all the production <laughs> of a big Taiwanese manufacturer. I don't think they're having problems with that. But remember, if a car, if your car has $600 worth of chips in it, more than 1,000 chips in it, just imagine what a MacBook has in it, right? There's other chips, too, that control all sorts of things. And I think even one little chip, maybe the chip that controls this display, you could, if you couldn't get that, you, the whole thing would be up in smoke. And I think that's what happened. That's my guess. So for those of you, I said, wait, don't buy anything from Apple until after uh, June 7th. Go ahead. 
Go ahead if you can get it. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I just don't know what the plan is now. You don't want to introduce a laptop in July or August. They could. I mean, Apple can do whatever they want, obviously. Maybe maybe they're going to scramble and have it out in a couple of weeks. Uh, that's completely possible. But I'm thinking now we're not going to hear about new hardware from Apple until uh, September. So go ahead. If you need it, buy it. Nothing should slow you down. If, if, if you can get to find a car, buy it. Go right ahead. The house is coming down on big tech. It's all coming to a head. You might have you might remember last, uh, was it last year? I guess it was all the executives of Google and Microsoft and Apple and Facebook all testified. Actually, Microsoft didn't go, I don't think. But everybody else testified in front of the House Antitrust Committee, the House Judiciary. After 16 months investigating the, quote, business tactics of companies like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google, Congress has issued, the House has issued five bills with bipartisan support to regulate the tech industry. This all came out on Friday. One bill would empower the Justice Department or the FTC to break up tech firms by forcing them to sell off parts of their business if there's a conflict of interest. Another bill bars companies from giving their own services preference over their rivals. Yet another bill blocks companies like Facebook from buying up little companies that might be competitors like, oh, I don't know, Instagram and WhatsApp. So that's the three that are maybe going to be a little controversial. The, the other two, last week the Senate already passed a measure, Amy Klobuchar's, Senator Klobuchar's uh, measure that would boost merger filing fees for large companies. That money goes to antitrust enforcers to investigate. So they're trying to beef up enforcement. A similar bill was introduced on Wednesday that would force platforms, Facebook, Apple platforms, to make data they collect interoperable. That's a fancy word the tech industry uses to mean I can read yours, you can read mine. Why is that important? Well, so you're not stuck. So you, if you go all in on Google, you can make, take it all and move it to another place, to Apple's iCloud or to Microsoft's OneDrive. Data portability, they call it. Five bills. All of a sudden, it's like, whoa, they got busy. 16 months of investigation. Now they now the other shoe drops. That'll be, uh, we'll watch with interest. I have mixed feelings. On the one hand, you know, the benefits of the tech industry have never been felt greater than during this pandemic, right? Imagine the pandemic if your kids couldn't go to school using Zoom or Google Classroom, or if you couldn't go to work remotely, many people couldn't, lost their jobs, could have been far worse. We, we owe a lot to tech, but at the same time, uh, I understand people are afraid. Some of it is, oh, they're just too, too rich. They made too much money. I don't like that. They're too rich. Cut them down to size. But some of it is they're too powerful. And it is true if you think about it. My friend Amy Webb calls it the big nine because she includes some Chinese companies in this. In fact, she wrote a book called The Big Nine, The Tech Titans. This was actually a couple of years ago, but uh, it was, well, she's a futurist, so it was ahead of its time, right? Uh, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Google. Those are the American ones. But then she throws in, oh, and IBM. Then she throws in Alibaba, which is a Chinese company, and Baidu, and Tencent, which you might know as the owners of TikTok. So those nine are are really dominant in our society. They've really changed our society. My my fear is I'm not sure if Congress is has a, a sharp enough scalpel to really figure out what to do with them. I hope the patient survives the surgery, I guess I'm saying. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. The Wireless Institute of Australia has asked for a review of the ham radio license exam and the management of the Amateur Operator's Certificate of Proficiency in response to what the WIA deems stagnant growth in the country's newly licensed operators. The Wireless Institute of Australia is concerned that even as pandemic conditions inspired many new hams in the nation to become licensed, the number of hams in Australia has shown no growth, particularly throughout 2020. 
The WIA report did not cite specific numbers in the news reports on its website, calling it only a lack of growth. The Wireless Institute of Australia is asking the Australian Communications and Media Authority to review the amateur service examination system and find a new model for managing the Certificate of Proficiency syllabus to encourage more amateur involvement. At the same time, the Wireless Institute of Australia continues to press for standard class licensees, the equivalent of the U.S. general class, or the U.K. intermediate licenses to be given access to the 6-meter band between 50 MHz and 52 MHz, in addition to the 52 to 54 MHz that they already have. Advanced licensees also have access to the full 4 MHz. For the FCC, 1978 started off not with a bang, but rather a ban. On January 1, 1978, the FCC banned the sale of older 23-channel CB sets, which did not meet the tougher type acceptance specifications of the new 40-channel units. Anticipating this deadline, manufacturers had been dumping the older radios at fire sale prices. In particular, the crystal-controlled 3- and 6-channel CB rigs were being sold, new, for as little as $10. This was a bonanza for hams looking for an inexpensive alternative to 2-meter FM. With 10-meter crystals installed, a CB radio could be realigned for 28 megahertz operation in less than 20 minutes. Hundreds of amateurs, myself included, snapped up these unwanted CB sets and converted them to 10 meters. Throughout 1978, 73 Magazine ran a series on various 11-meter radios and how to get them tuned up on 10. Unfortunately, hams never set up a standardized 10-meter band plan. As a result, each area had their own local calling channels, and the concept fizzled out after a few years. Speaking of bands, the FCC in 1978 adopted rules which prohibited the marketing of amplifiers capable of operation between 24 and 35 megahertz. They also imposed a type acceptance program on amplifiers operating below 144 megahertz. The ARRL had vigorously opposed these actions to no avail. Catalogs, like the one from Lafayette Radio, were full of ads for amplifiers designed for operation between 15 and 6 meters. Although these were ostensibly amateur units, they were designed for a 5-watt AM input and were styled to match the company's 11-meter radios. The FCC saw through the charade and imposed their rather draconian measures in order to cut down on illegal high-powered CB operations, particularly in the 10.5-meter band between 27.4 and 28 megahertz. On March 24, 1978, the FCC announced that all prior call sign policies and procedures, written or unwritten, are canceled and hereby replaced. No longer would there be any specific call signs or secondary station licenses. Instead, the FCC implemented the four-group call sign system, which continues to this day. For years, technicians had been denied access to the full 2-meter band. They had obtained 145 through 147 megahertz way back in 1959, 147 through 148 megahertz in 1972, and 144.5 through 145 megahertz in 1977. At the beginning of 1978, technicians were still banned from the 144.0 through 144.5 megahertz segment. Ever since 1969, the ARRL had asked the FCC to give them the full 2-meter band. Finally, on May 15, 1978, the FCC said yes. In addition, they allowed technicians and generals back into the 6-meter segment between 50.0 and 50.1 MHz, which had been taken away from them in 1968 as part of incentive licensing. At last, Technicians and generals had full privileges above 50 MHz. However, general class hams still had one more fight. They were banned from using slow scan TV on 75 through 15 meters. That was a fight that would be won another day. 
For those technicians itching to utilize their full 2-meter privileges, manufacturers were introducing new, synthesized transceivers. Radios such as Clegg's FMDX and FM28, the Midland 13510, the Pace Communicator 2, the Geneve GTX 800, the Heathkit HW2036A, and the KDK FM 2015R liberated hams from the confining world of 12 channels and opened up the entire 2 meter band to exploration in 800 5 kilohertz steps. Late in the year, Henry Radio introduced the Tempo S1, a synthesized 2 meter, 1.5 watt handheld. The average price of these radios was about $350 or $1,100 in today's inflation-adjusted dollars. There was some good news for those amateurs who couldn't afford or didn't need an expensive synthesized rig. The prices on discontinued crystal control 2-meter radios fell by 60% or more as dealers made room for the new synthesized units. Unfortunately, crystal-controlled rigs were the only items with falling prices. The U.S. was locked into double-digit inflation, and the ARRL warned that the $12 membership dues would probably have to be increased. Otherwise, the league was doing fine. Membership was $165,000, which was about half the number of the 330,000 hams. Incidentally, the ARRL's membership today is also $165,000, but there are almost 700,000 hams. League membership has dropped from 50% to 25%. The big news towards the end of 1978 was NBVM. NBVM? That stands for Narrow Band Voice Modulation. A description of this mode is quite technical, but in summary, on FM, a frequency compander compressed the signal bandwidth on transmit, and expanded the signal bandwidth on receive. For AM, an amplitude compander compressed the signal amplitude on transmit and expanded the signal amplitude on receive. The result was a significant reduction in the transmitted bandwidth, less co-channel interference, and an improved signal-to-noise ratio. FCC tests showed that a signal 40 dB stronger and only 2 kHz away would not cause harmful interference to the received signal. It featured a 1300 Hz bandwidth, which was one half that of sideband, one fourth of AM, and one tenth of FM. Despite the apparent advantage of NBVM, it never took off in the amateur community. Perhaps NBVM failed because at the end of 1978, hams were preoccupied with WARC 79. No, that's not an FM translator call sign. It stood for the World Administrative Radio Conference, which would take place in 1979. Amateurs were optimistic, yet concerned. In our next installment, we will look at WARC-79. So, until then, tune up your amplitude and frequency companders and explore that new 2-meter band. Time now for the AMSAT report. MIRSAT-1, that's the Mauritius Imagery and Radio Satellite 1, the first amateur radio CubeSat from the Indian island nation of Mauritius, is expected to be deployed from the International Space Station on June 22nd. MIRSAT-1 will carry an amateur radio VU digipeter. A downlink of 436.925 has been coordinated. AMSAT board members Patrick, WD9EWK, and Bruce, KK9DO, were on the June 3rd episode of ARRL's Eclectic Tech podcast. Patrick always has great information on operating satellites and about all the roving he does. Well worth a listen. You can find it at ARRL.org forward slash eclectic. If you're looking for new DXCC entities on satellite, Frank, K3TRM, will be active as VP2V stroke K3TRM from Tortola, British Virgin Islands, July 4th through the 17th. He'll be operating HF as well as digital and satellite. The AMSAT report comes to us each week via Bruce Page, KK5DO. 
It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that solar activity was lower this week, with the average daily sunspot number declining from 34.9 last week to 13.9 this week. The average was affected by the single day with no sunspots, which was last Saturday, June 12th. Average daily solar flux dropped from 77.7 to 75.2. The Pendington Observatory in British Columbia, which is the source for the 10.7 centimeter solar flux readings, did not report a new reading on Wednesday, June 16th. So we averaged the morning, which was 76.9 at 1700 UTC, and the afternoon reading of 77.1 at 2300 UTC to come up with 77 as a reasonable approximation. Normally, the local noon reading, which takes place at 2000 UTC, is the official number for the day. You can get the three daily readings directly from the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory on the web. On Thursday, the noon reading was 85, which is not quite as high as it has been, which was 88 back on May 26th. The predicted solar flux for the near term as we look ahead is 75 on June 19th and 20th, 80 on June 21st through the 25th. 77 on June 26th through the 28th, 78 on June 29th through July 7th, and 79 on July 8th through the 10th. Looking ahead now at the predicted planetary A in DICE, it'll be 5 on June 19th through the 25th, 7 on June 26th, 5 on June 27th through July 4th, 15, 10, and 8 on July 5th through the 7th, respectively, 5 on July 8th, and 8 on July 9th through the 11th. According to spaceweather.com, something big may be about to happen on the Sun. It's called the termination event, and it could kickstart Solar Cycle 25 into a higher gear. A handful of solar physicists are bucking conventional wisdom to promote this idea, and we will soon find out if they're correct. If you've never heard of the termination event, you're not alone. Many researchers have never heard of it either. It's a relatively new idea in solar physics, championed by Scott McIntosh, a solar physicist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the USA, along with colleague Bob Learman of the University of Maryland. According to the two scientists, vast bands of magnetism are drifting across the surface of the Sun. When oppositely charged bands collide at the equator, they annihilate or terminate. There's no explosion. This is magnetism, not antimatter. Scott McIntosh said that if the Terminator event happens soon, as he expects, New Solar Cycle 25 could have a magnitude that rivals the top few since record-keeping began. This is, to say the least, controversial. Most solar physicists believe that Solar Cycle 25 will be weak, akin to the anemic Solar Cycle 24, which barely peaked back in 2012-13. to Orthodox models of the Sun's inner magnetic dynamo favor a weak cycle and do not even include the concept of terminators. The researchers said that they found that the longer the time between each cycle's terminator, the weaker the next cycle would be. Conversely, the shorter the time between terminators, the stronger the next solar cycle would be. Solar Cycle 25 is shaping up so that its terminator event is coming only 10 years since the terminator event that began Solar Cycle 24. Previous solar cycles with such short intervals have been amongst the strongest in recorded history. These ideas may be controversial, but they have a virtue that all scientists can appreciate. They're testable. If the termination event happens soon and Solar Cycle 25 skyrockets, these researchers may be onto something. Time will tell. You can read much more and see some diagrams at spaceweather.com. Very well-known contester and DXer Frank Donovan, W3LPL, recently did a talk for the Potomac Valley Radio Club, the PVRC, What to Expect During the Rising Years of Solar Cycle 25. His illustrated presentation runs for more than an hour, but it's worth viewing on YouTube. Among other things, Donovan talked about the K index. He pointed out that when the K index is 3, 160, and 80 meters are likely to be enhanced. Very few days of very high K indices have shown up in the past five years. But these typically happen when the interplanetary magnetic field is pointing southward. But the real killer 
And this is what really affects the very strong storms at solar maximum, is the period of time over which the interplanetary magnetic field happens to persist. And if it persists in that southward orientation, the necessary precursor to storms, if it persists for hours, then hold on to your hat, because we're going to have some really severe storms. Frank Donovan, W3LPL, speaking recently at a PVRC club meeting. His presentation was recorded, and it's available on YouTube. The fourth edition of Ham Radio for Dummies is now available. Ward Silver, and 0 ax is once again the author. Since the previous edition, a lot has happened in Ham Radio. Every chapter has been updated in the same manner. Many topics have been added and updated, including software-defined radios, many new digital modes and digital voice modes, and remote license testing. This book is not meant to be a study guide, rather, it's a written reference Elmer. The book contains a lot of information, but broken up into small chunks for easier comprehension. Ham Radio for Dummies is a great introduction to ham radio for those who might be interested or just getting started. But there's also some things for the experienced ham as well. Some of my favorite parts of reviewing this book were the labeled photos of all kinds of connectors, from RF to audio. The pictures and diagrams in this book are a huge help for those learning about ham radio for the first time. Also, the book is jam-packed with quality hyperlinks to websites with more information on the topics than will fit into a single book. It also has an extensive glossary. ARRL Kids Day gets underway on Saturday, June 19th at 1800 UTC and concludes at 2359 UTC. Sponsored by the Boring Oregon Amateur Radio Club, Kids Day has a simple exchange suitable for younger operators. First name, your age, location, and favorite color. After that, the contact can be as long or as short as each participant prefers. Kids Day can be your opportunity to take the time to get the kids on the air and mentor future amateur radio operators to show them the fun and excitement that ham radio has to offer. You just might be introducing the next generation of hams to the airwaves. Many communities have begun relaxing restrictions put in place due to COVID-19, but participants should follow the advice of state and local health authorities regarding gathering in groups, the wearing of face masks, and social distancing. Where applicable, if inviting youngsters into your shack is not feasible, consider other options for mentoring, such as using social media platforms, Zoom, or other no-contact methods. See the announcement for suggested frequencies. As with any on-the-air activity that has included unlicensed individuals, control operators must observe third-party traffic restrictions when making DX contacts. Additional details are on the ARRL website. Foundations of Amateur Radio My first ever interaction with amateur radio was a field day on Bolterhuis Eiland near Leiden in the Netherlands when I was about 12. The station was set up in an army tent and the setting was Jamboree on the air or Jota. My second field day a decade ago was a visit to a local club set up in the bush. At that point I already had my license and I'd just started taking the first baby steps in what so far has been a decade-long journey of discovery into this amazing hobby. A field day is really an excuse to build a portable station away from the shack and call CQ. A decade on I vividly remember one member, Marty, now Victor Kilo 6 Romeo Charlie, calling CQDX and getting responses back from all over the world. From that day on I looked for any opportunity to get on air and make noise. Often that's something I do in the form of a contest. I love this as a way of making contacts because each interaction is short and sweet, there's lots of stations playing from all over the planet, and each contest has rules and scores. As a result, you can compare your activity with others and look back at your previous efforts to see if you improved or not. As you've heard me repeatedly say, I like to learn from each activity and see if there are things that I could have done differently. I tend to think of this as a cycle of continuous improvement. A few months ago, a friend asked me if I was interested in doing a contest with him. For me, that was a simple question to answer. Yes, of course. Over the last few months, we've been talking about how we'd like to do this and what we'd like to accomplish. For example, for me, there's been a regular dissatisfaction that during portable logging, I've made mistakes with recording the band correctly in the log and having to manually go back and fix this, taking away from making contacts and having fun. 
To prevent that, I wanted to make sure that we had electronic logging that was linked to the radio in the same way as I do in my shack, so it didn't happen again. It was a small improvement, but I felt it was important. Doing this meant that we'd either need to sort out a computer link, known as CAT or Computer Assisted Tuning, for his radio in the vehicle, or bring my radio. CAT control, power adapters, as well as bring a laptop, power supply, and last but not least, find space in the vehicle to mount all this so it would work ergonomically for a 24-hour mobile contest. The vehicle in question is the pride and joy of Thomas Victor Kilo 6 Victor Charlie Romeo, a 20-odd-year-old Toyota Land Cruiser ute with two seats. Three if you count the middle of the bench, and neither of us would ever be described as petite, so space is strictly limited. In playing this out and trying to determine what needed to go where, we discovered that this wasn't going to work, and I made the bold proposal to go old school and use a paper log. This would mean that we could use the existing radio without needing to sort out cat control, the need for any power adapters, no space required for a laptop, no power for that, no extra wiring in the vehicle, and a whole lot more simplicity. So that's what we're doing, paper log and a headlamp to be able to see in the dark. I must confess that I'm apprehensive of this whole caper, but I keep reminding myself that this too is an experience, good or bad, and at the end of the day we're here to have fun. I might learn that this was the worst idea I've ever had, or I might learn that this works great. It's not the first time I've used a paper log, so I'm aware of plenty of pitfalls, not the least of which is deciphering my own handwriting the ingenious project of three, or was it four, different handwriting systems taught to me by subsequent teachers in different countries. There's the logistics of being able to read and write at an odd distance, trying to work out how to operate the microphone with the wrong hand, though we are trialling a headset and boom microphone with a push-to-talk button, and then there's the radio, one I've used before but not in a contest setting, and not whilst driving around on the seat of a four-wheel drive hell-bent on rattling my teeth from their sockets. On the plus side, I've done a contest with my friend before, and he's familiar with my competitive streak, and we're both up for a laugh, so I'm confident that despite the challenges that lie ahead, we're going to make fun and enjoy the adventure. I can't wait to find out if simplifying things will result in a better experience, and only trying it will tell. I'll let you know how it goes. When was the last time you stepped out of your comfort zone and what did you do? How did it work out? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Some announcements. ARRL emailed LIFE members on June 16th asking them to verify their mailing address. To those who inquired, rest assured that the email request was legitimate and came from ARRL headquarters. If you need to update your address information, call area code 860 594 0200 or email membership at ARRL.org or just respond to the email you received. Gerald Gall, KE7GGV, has just launched a new net in the Portland, Oregon, Vancouver, Washington metro for the visually impaired, blind, and disabled. The net will run on the fourth Sunday of each month at 8 p.m. Pacific time on the W7RAT 440.400 repeater. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station has announced that a slow-scan television event will be held from June 21st to the 26th, focusing on amateur radio on the Space Shuttle, the Mir Space Station, and the International Space Station. Transmissions will be on 145.8 MHz FM using PD-120 SSTV mode. When the colonial army fought for the American independence in 1776, the French became the soldiers' primary allies. Now the French are offering another gesture of support to the 13 colonies, and this time by 13 colonies we mean the annual special event by that name. As the event kicks off on July 1st, French radio operators will be adding a new bonus station. Tangle Mike 13 COL will join bonus stations Gulf Bravo 13 COL in England and Whiskey Mike 13. 3 PEN in Philadelphia. This year also marks the 13th year for the 13 Colonies event, which will be on the air through July 7th. It marks America's Independence Day, which is observed on July 4th. Last year, event operators made more than 202,000 contacts. This year, the improved band conditions have organizers feeling optimistic that they can beat that total, especially with some stations operating via satellite and at least two bonus stations using digital voice. 
All stations will be on HF, so be listening for K2A through K2N and work towards your certificate and in the individual QSL cards, which this year will feature a ship which will be associated with each colony, city, or country. For more details, visit QRZ.com, the 13 Colonies Special Event page on Facebook, or the event website at www.13colonies.us. That's 13colonies.us. In the UK, Ofcom has published updated versions of their simplified guidance on the new electromagnetic fields license condition that will apply to Spectrum licensees, and they've also updated their EMF calculator. On June the 17th, Ofcom said that in May they published their final decision to include this new condition in licenses. The new condition aims to ensure Spectrum licensees operate their equipment within international guidelines for EMF exposure. At the same time, Ofcom also published the final version of their license condition, as well as detailed guidance on how licensees could ensure that they complied with the new condition. Now, Ofcom has published updated versions of their simplified guidance documents, which provide step-by-step -step direction on how to check compliance with the new condition. The four documents are simplified guidance for all Spectrum users, additional guidance for ship radio licensees, additional guidance for amateur radio users, and additional guidance for aeronautical radio users. The RSGB's specialist EMF group has helped Ofcom customise its guidance for radio amateurs. The updated guide is much simplified from the earlier version and now comprises just four steps. Step 1. Do I need to comply? Step 2. Carrying out a compliance check. Step 3. Managing compliance. And Step 4. Keeping an appropriate compliance record. Ofcom has also published an updated version of their EMF calculator, which licensees can use to check compliance. To find the latest versions of the calculator and the documentation, visit ofcom.org.uk forward slash manage your license, and that's hyphenated, manage your license forward slash EMF. I'll give you that again, ofcom.org.uk forward slash manage hyphen your hyphen license forward slash EMF. The RSGB's EMF page, where you can find their own simplified version of the EMF calculator tailored specifically to radio amateurs, is at rsgb.org forward slash EMF. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In the first two segments of this series on promoting your ham radio club's event, we covered the basic outline for a two-paragraph public service announcement. If you missed that show, check out our archived shows on the internet and stay tuned to This Week in Amateur Radio when we'll repeat our webpage address. So this time, we'll put all the information about our public service announcement onto paper and get it ready to mail to radio and TV stations in the area. We covered a sample PSA last time. Let's get out our notes and get the word processor running and get ready to enter the final draft. I would suggest a bold, large type heading which reads, Public Service Announcement. This will go all the way across the top of the paper. Remember, the final product must fit onto a single side of a single sheet of paper. This is very important as I'll explain later. Next line, left justified, type in kill date. This is the date that you want your PSA to stop running, which would usually be the day after the event. Next, paste in the text of your two paragraph PSA. Make sure it's spell checked and double spaced. Your PSA text should be a large, bold, simple text font. Now hit the enter key a few times and enter contact person. This should be the name, address, email, fax, phone number of a person to contact for information about the event described in the PSA. This person should be able to answer phoned questions about the event. Be careful whom you choose for this position. Be sure to include any relevant titles like club president for this person. Also include a formal address and contact information about the club submitting the event. I always like to add a five-word phrase in parenthesis after the name of the club, like 
the Bowen County Amateur Radio Club, a not-for-profit organization. Take a look at your PSA sheet. It should be visibly obvious with a very quick glance what part is to be read on the air. The starting and ending points should be very obvious. The script must be grammatically correct and spelling perfect. You may punctuate for breathing marks if you know how to do that. It should also be readable in 30 seconds or less. Have more than one person read it timed to be sure it's the proper length. Remember, the burden is on you, so don't give the PSA manager or disc jockey a reason not to read your PSA on the air. Make it ready to use right out of the envelope. Any PSA with bad grammar, single line spacing, misspellings, or just a lousy read are easily passed over for others that are easier to read on the air as is. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. You can visit the ARRL Learning Network page to register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions. Please remember that Learning Network webinars are an ARRL members only benefit. Antenna Zoning. This is a special six-part webinar series hosted by Fred Hoppengarten, K1VR, author of Antenna Zoning for the Radio Amateur. Part 1. Permitting in a nutshell, this webinar already has taken place and is available on the webinar archive. Part 2. Principles and Preparation. This webinar has also already taken place and is available on the webinar archive. Part 3. The application is scheduled for Monday, June 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Part 4. PRB1, a deep dive will be held on Wednesday, June 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Part 5, I look at even more laws, is scheduled for Monday, June 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Part 6, the hearing, will be held on Wednesday, June 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern, that's 1800 UTC. Introduction to Remote HF Operation, hosted by David Lanfranconi, W6DGE, and Kevin Chinwheeler. N7KSW of the Kyle Poly Amateur Radio Club will be held on Tuesday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Lanfern Coney and Shin Wheeler will discuss the idea, process, and challenges encountered while getting their club's remote HF station on the air, as well as some methods and resources available for those with a similar interest. A Q&A session and live demo are included. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. As always, the ARRL learning network schedule is subject to change. Andrew Barron, Zulu Lima 3 Delta Whiskey, is pleased to announce that his new Radio Today guide to the Yesu FTDX101D and the FTDX101MP is now available from the RSGB Bookshop, Amazon and Amazon Kindle. This is Andrew's ninth amateur radio book and the first to feature a Yesu radio. The D version offers 100 watts power output whilst the MP runs 200 watts. The FTDX101 is an exciting contest grade transceiver. You'll be able to learn about the FT8 preset, dual receivers, and the SDR bandoscope, as well as the voice, RITI, PSK, and CW message keyers and decoders. This book will help you to get the most out of this complicated transceiver. The book has loads of tips to help you to discover new ways to use the radio. It's right up to date with the latest firmware release, which added a couple of important new features. The National Ham Fest, considered the premier radio rally in the UK, has been postponed until September of 2022. Organizers made the announcement on their website and Twitter account on Friday, June 11th. They said that a number of factors were making it impossible to predict whether the event can be held safely in September of this year. With at least three months worth of planning involved in staging the ham fest, they determined it was wiser to wait another year. The announcement said that organizers not only wish to act in a responsible way towards a large team of volunteers who staff the event and make it possible, but also the visitors and the partner organizations, all of whom make the event a success. 
The show was to be held, as always, at the Newark and Nottinghamshire showgrounds. The rally was held by the National Hamfest Lincoln in association with the Radio Society of Great Britain. The first Youngsters on the Air contest has already taken place and was a big success. The next contest will take place on Sunday, July the 18th. The IARU reported that over 700 logs were received within the deadline for the first contest and are currently being worked through to provide the final results as soon as possible. Meanwhile, claimed results can be looked at on the Yota contest website. The IARU was pleased to note that it had received over 100 specific Yota logs, where operators have to be under 25 years old. The second contest session will be taking place soon. Due to unforeseen date collisions, the IARU has had to shift the next session from the previously announced Saturday the 17th of July to Sunday the 18th of July. The announced contest period will remain the same from 10 to 21.59 UTC. So, are you ready to compete in the next Yota contest? Everyone in the ham radio community can take part. The contests take place three times per year and only last for 12 hours. The aim is to increase the youngsters' activity on the air, strengthening the reputation of the Yota program and to demonstrate support for youngsters across the world. Eight different categories have been implemented, which includes special ones only for youngsters under 25 years of age. They cover 80 metres, 40 metres, 20 metres, 15 metres and the 10 metre band, and the competition will take place using CW and single sideband modes. The contest exchange used will be the age of the participating operators. Different ages also serve as multipliers during the contest. Contacts within the participants' own continent are worth one point. Working DX is worth three points, but the most points will be achieved by working youngsters. The younger the operator, the more points one will get for the QSO. During the past month, the IARU received several rule translations in various languages, and the IARU thanks the contributors. So, if you're not all that fluent in English, check out the translations at www.iaru-r1.org. Search for YOTA. Your question may have been answered already, but if you have an inquiry, you can drop the YOTA contest committee an email using contest at ham-yota.com and they'll be happy to reply. The first amateur radio CubeSat from Mauritius is about to be deployed from the International Space Station. MIRSAT-1 was sent on June 3rd from Florida's Kennedy Space Center aboard the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and is scheduled for deployment on Tuesday, June 22nd. Its initials stand for Mauritius Imagery and Radio Telecommunication Satellite 1, and it is a creation of researchers from the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council. The project went forward with support from the local amateur radio society and experts from technological provider AAC Clyde Space UK. The CubeSat's missions include engaging in experimental satellite communication with other islands using an amateur radio digipeter. The VU9600 BPS GMSK digipeter will be available to hams around the world when the satellite is not in use for this or any other of its other missions. There is a downlink on 436.925 MHz. Decoders to be downloaded for free by schools and the World Amateur Radio Community were developed by Chris AC2CZ and Daniel EA4GPZ. Visit the AMSAT bulletin board and the Space Mauritius website for links. MIRSAT-1 has an expected lifetime of between two and three years, and during that time it is expected to make ground contact with Mauritius four to five times daily. On the 12th of December 1921, Paul Godley to Zulu Echo, located in Scotland, received the first complete and verified amateur radio shortwave transatlantic message ever sent from a station based in Greenwich, Connecticut, call sign 1 Bravo Charlie Golf. This reception was during the second of four transatlantic tests coordinated between the ARRL and the RSGB, which started on the 7th of December 1921 for a period of 10 days. 
After arriving in England, Godley's initial station setup was in London. This location, however, proved unsuitable as it was hampered by local noise. Before leaving London, Godley discussed his plans with both Guillermo Marconi and Harold Beveridge, who were coincidentally in London too. After a brief reconnoitre of Scotland, Godley, with the assistance of the local Glasgow-based Marconi company, finally settled on Ardrossan as the site to conduct his reception experiments. For these experiments, Godley had a special permit issued by the GPO. Godley used state-of-the-art receiving apparatus, which was a Paragon Regenerative Receiver and an Armstrong Superheterodyne Receiver, hence his nickname Paragon Paul. Godley also erected a 1,300-foot beverage antenna system, which was to be the first installation and use of a beverage antenna system in the UK. Over the coming months, the RSGB's Radcom magazine will be including detailed articles on the history of the series of transatlantic tests and explaining how you can take part in a number of events celebrating their centenary. The Crocodile Rock Amateur Group are celebrating the centenary of Paul Godley's success in collaboration with North Ayrshire Council. With the assistance of the GMDX Group, the Special Event Stations Golf Bravo 2 Zulu Echo and Golf Bravo 100 2 Zulu Echo respectively will be operating from the 1st to the 28th of December 2021. These stations will be operating from both the original site in Ardrossan and from the North Ayrshire Heritage Centre, located at Saltcoats. North Ayrshire Council will be hosting an exhibition celebrating Paul Godley and his transatlantic tests conducted in Ardrossan. Local primary and secondary school children will also benefit from this exhibition through an active and appropriate STEM theme that will include radio communications. For the benefit of all UK and Crown Dependency Radio Amateurs, the CRAG have negotiated the rare two Zulu Echo suffix, which can be used between the 1st and 28th of December 2021. The suffix can be used in conjunction with your own call sign, so it's your own call sign stroke to Zulu Echo. At the time of this news update, over in the USA, preparations are also underway by the ARRL to commemorate the December 1921 transatlantic tests with an operating event which will be held in December 2021. More will be explained in later RADCOM issues. So why don't you or your club get involved in the celebrations by using the two Zulu Echo suffix and have some fun with the unfolding celebration event? Crocodile Rock Amateur Group is keen to welcome volunteers with all aspects of the centenary celebrations and particularly with operating, logistics and heritage archive coordination. The team are particularly looking for a portable mast, for example. To volunteer or assist, please contact Bob Alexander, Golf Mike Zero Delta Echo Quebec or Robbie Venard, Golf Mike Zero Sierra Echo India. Their email addresses can be found at qrz.com. And finally this week, a heartwarming ham radio story. And to get the story underway, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from ARRL headquarters in Newington. ARRL member Ben Murray, KD8JBS of Bryan, Ohio, the vision-impaired subject of a recent TV news piece in Toledo, says new technology he's now using has permitted him to enjoy ham radio more fully. The eSight device resembles virtual reality goggles. Murray has nothing but enthusiastic praise for the technology. He told ARRL that it's helped immensely with reading his radio's displays and logs and being able to socialize. Plus, he's able to see his computer screen now. Murray works as a radio station board operator. In his spare time, he's an ARRL VEC volunteer examiner of VE. Assistant ARRL VEC manager Amanda O'Brien and one NHL called him one of our most dedicated VEs. As Murray explains, the technology uses a camera to process an image in real time, and the image is then presented back to the user onto OLED screens in front of his eyes, and he can zoom in up to 24 times. He talked about seeing his dad for the first time. They had me look over at my dad. 
and all I could do was just stand there and sob. Once I got a hold of myself and realized what had just happened, she goes, you saw for the very first time in your entire life. Murray, 32, who was born legally blind with optic nerve atrophy, wears a pair of conventional eyeglasses behind his eSight device. The smart glasses have provided him with essentially 20-20 vision. A ham since 2008, Murray upgraded to Amateur Extra in 2012. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. For the first 26 years of his life, Murray says, he was passed from doctor to doctor, ophthalmologist to ophthalmologist. In 2015, he learned about eSight's smart eyeglasses that fit over the user's head. At first, he was skeptical, but once he experienced it for himself, he was sold. A community fundraiser helped Ben raise the $15,000 needed for his first pair of eSight glasses. He now wears the latest update. The adaptive technology is not widely covered by health insurance, and he's on a campaign to change that. As for ham radio, Murray's favorite activities incorporate a public service bent. I enjoy ham fests and VE testing sessions. I'm the VE liaison for Williams County, Ohio, and I'm the emergency coordinator, he told ARRL. I also enjoy public service activities such as festivals and parades where they include amateur radio for communications. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.